Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Fridays with Fiscal. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about um, updates that were made between uh, July and August for USAS and for payroll. I'll go ahead and start first with payroll, and then Pat will be doing the USAS portion. So we'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> on July 16th, on the 644 release, uh, we had a, a few bug fixes that were corrected. We had uh, the SERS reporting, uh, where the SERS surcharge report um, updated to account for rehired date, and when an employee is rehired, a rehired retiree, before it wasn't doing that. So now we've corrected that on the surcharge report. Um, also on the surcharge report, uh, the date range for reporting had been updated to include the pay group date range from the payroll. So like if they were doing additions, uh, they had different beginning and ending dates. So we updated that to make the correction there. <clears throat> um, on the SERS per pay report, it will now validate uh, user added values to prevent too many characters in the submission file. Uh, there was just, you know, like typos possibly when they were setting it up on the SERS per pay report and it was allowing it. So now we've, we've added validation. So like the, the pay cycle, the pay code, those have to be certain uh, lengths and it will validate against that. So if they have a typo, they have more than they're supposed to or not enough, it's going to actually validate and tell them, hey, you can't create this because you don't have X amount of characters in these fields. Um, we also updated the benefit personal to pay uh, it was failing to, uh, it was failing when um, not including partial days and posting the current. So we had issues with that. So the process now is no longer going to attempt to create future amounts for zero dollars um, to or anybody that has 0.5 personal days. The option to not pay partial days is checked. So when they're setting it up, if they have do not you know not to pay partial days, it is checked it will not pay those days for the partial days uh, that, were, that were basically not used. We found that when uh, people were running at personal to pay, it was not, it was not working correctly. So we, we fixed that. Um, the days to get paid is going to now round down to zero. So it's still gonna try to create a, uh, a future pay, but it, it, will, it will cause exceptions on it, on it running. So, that should work more, uh, not more, that should work correctly now when processing the personal to pay. Um, the W2 report view, actually I had this happen to me. It was actually showing like all of the options. So, like when you went into the W2 report, you know, normally you just see uh, the option on the screen where you can, you know, choose whether you wanna, you know, just process the report, do the, the uh, W2s, whatever, it was actually showing like everything all at one time and it wasn't correct. So they fixed that. So it's it's now correct when you go to W2 report reporting, it will you know show you know your options and not show everything on the screen. Um <clears throat> also on that release, we had uh, a couple of improvements, which I will show you. One of them was the payroll initialization. We kind of changed that a little bit. So if I go into payroll, oops, maybe <laughs> get a little click happy here. If I go to the payroll processing option and click initialize new payroll, you'll see that the setup is different than it used to be. Before in the past, you had to go in, initialize with your original dates. And then if you were doing additions, you had to go back in or up and add the particular dates and the particular pay groups. Here, you can actually go in and you can choose, you know, set up your screen just like you normally would. Oops, hold on here. Type today. <laughs> I can't type today. There we go. And then what you can, what the district has to do is they go in, 
Now, if they wanted to select all these different pay groups or just certain ones, and they want to select them all at the same time and move them over, they can click on one and then they can hold that CTRL button on the bottom left and choose all the different pay groups that they want to include for this these particular dates and move them over. Maybe, come on. Ah, I think it's my internet, there we go. And then what they do now is if they have additions, they're gonna click on the add date range selection. And when they do that, it's gonna get pop them up where they can actually go in and choose different dates for additions. So maybe we got, we'll just do this, April 23rd to September 1st. And then here, again, I can choose the particular pay groups that I want to be included in this additions option. And they obviously can do this for, you know, maybe they have two or three additions options. They can do that just by selecting add date range. And then they can initialize the payroll that way. That is just like one time setup. Now we do have a JIRA issue out there. It's USPS RFB 713. And it's asking for those default settings to be saved and recalled, like have a save and recall feature like we did in classic. Um, we will be getting, you know, eventually work on that. But for now, it's kind of a hassle. They have to go in and select the pay groups, et cetera, each, you know, each time they process the payroll. Um, but we will get that corrected or fixed at a later time. Um, the other thing that we did was we updated the payout history import. So when the districts are importing the data from Classic, um, we updated it to import the description field from the extract before it wasn't pulling the description field from the, I think it was a, the job screen. So we're pulling that information in now when you do the, uh, the extract. <clears throat> On July 30th, we had the 645 release. Uh, we had some bug fixes. One of them was the SCRS new hire. I, we needed to validate the birth date and gender to prevent nulls from being included on the report. So basically now if they're creating the SCRS new hire report, they can't have those fields, the birth date and the gender, they cannot be empty, they can't be blank. So we pretty much created a validation for that. On um, the SCRS per pay report, we set it up now so uh, it'll prevent employees without SCRS withholding from being included on the report for special payrolls. Evidently, there was a district that found this, so we, have, we corrected that. And also on the per pay report, uh, we corrected the sorting of the submission file and the secondary sorting option for the PDF report. Uh, in, the, in the past, it was not sorting by name, it was sorting by employee number and all our other options were working, but not that particular employee name option. So after the main sort on the report, on the SRF prepare report is chosen, it's going to always sort after that by the beginning day and the earnings code. Um, another uh, thing that we fixed in a bug fix on July 30th was the auto report. We corrected a bug that was causing the failure um, of the auto report when a position um, was not set up for a specific attendance entry. So like they had an attendance entry in there, they didn't have a position associated with it. It was basically causing a failure on the auto report. So we corrected that. And then for payroll posting, um, was incorrectly displaying a job failed message when there were uh, when there were corrected initialization errors. So they had an error that corrected it, but it was still uh, showing the error remaining on the error report. So we fixed that as well. <coughs> on August 6th, we had the 646 release. Uh, we had some bug fixes, lots of bug fixes to the SCRS per pay report. Um, we had um, employee with no SCRS payroll items, they, uh, going, they were removed from the report. So basically there was a problem with people showing up on the report that didn't have a payroll item. So we corrected that. We added a validation for the incorrect beginning and ending dates when you're processing the report. Uh, so we added a new error when the date uh, was invalid. And that's kind of like how classic was, you know, if you add invalid dates, it would tell you, hey, you know, there's no payroll dates for this. There's no beginning and any dates or payroll dates. 
So we actually corrected that on the redesign now. It would basically say, hey, there's no payroll file that matched those dates that you entered. Um, and we added a validation when there's no ESERS pay cycle entered on the SRF for pay report. Um, we corrected the hour calculation for doc days. It was in the past, it was not reducing the hours on the report for doc days. It was basically if, if someone had docs for uh, the hours, it was not taking those days away. It was just they were remaining on there. So we corrected that. Uh, we removed the O1 records from report if there are no earnings or contribution amounts. So we found that um, this after district purchased a new contract in and they ran a pay, if an employee had a, a last pay on accrued um, and a new contract amount, all the new contract earnings were going to accrued. So we fixed that uh, basically showing, you know, just the new contract amounts are out there. Um, and that's actually how Classic used to work. So on the SERS report, it would show at, at earnings quota 04 with amounts and no days and no hours. And obviously SERS is not gonna like anything like that because it normally should never show days and hours for uh, an 04 earnings code. Um, and then it had an 01 or with no earnings and no contributions. So it was like all messed up, it was all backwards. And the, the 01 code had no earnings, no contributions, but it had days and hours. So we corrected that so that um, the, the SERS 01 earnings code now has earnings and contributions with days and hours. And the 04 for those accrued doesn't, did not show up with days and hours, which is correct, which it should not be because accrued wages do not have days and hours associated with them. <clears throat> um, we did, made an improvement to the ESERS adjustment message on the SCRS per pay documentation records. In documentation, we corrected it. So now uh, the info, informational message wording, it was changed from ESERS adjustment for you know, whatever type will need to be made in the amount of however many, whatever the dollar amount is to adjust for obviously the type or the dollar amount. Oh, let's see here. What did we do here? Oh, sorry. Let me, let me go back into this. Step. So the informational message warning, it was changed from ESA's adjustment for type will need to be made in the amount of however much. We changed it to adjustment for whatever type of the dollar amount will be included in the SCRS submission file. So we did make a change to an error, the way the error adjustment message read. Um, the SCRS surcharge report, we uh, made a change to prevent the report failure when an employee has only voided payments because the, uh, before on the SCRS surcharge, if an employee only maybe they were gone and they had avoided payment in there. Um, it was including it and it should not be including that on the report. So they corrected that. So if, there, if that's all they had was avoided payment, it's not including that employee on the report any longer. Um, and then we also made a change on the new hire report. The employee is only to be included one time. So maybe you had a new employee, but he had, they have multiple positions. Uh, what was happening previously is the employee was on there, on there multiple times because they had multiple positions. They corrected that to only uh, show the employee one time on the new hire report. And then also on this uh, 646 release, we made updates to the Ohio tax tables, which started on September 1st because of the uh, reduction in the tax table. So we made changes to all of that. Then on August 26, we had a hot fix go out on 646.1. Um, it was a new feature that we added. It was the implement, uh, we implemented the option to calculate STRS withholding based on earnings rather than total gross. We had um, never, we never up, you know, basically added that. And we found that there was a district within Ohio that actually processed their STRS based on earnings rather than on total gross. So we updated that and 
um, <clears throat> we, up, we fixed that in the configuration and we also added it in, in the program itself. Let me show you where it's at. If, the, if for some reason you have a district that needs to be um, marked as based on earnings rather than on total gross, we would go to find you here, system configuration. And then we go to the SRS configuration option. And right here is where we would change that base withholding on earnings. So if you possibly have a district that is based on withholding on earnings, that box would be checked and saved. So we added that feature. Okay. On August 27th on the 647 release, we had some bug fixes again to the SDRS per pay report. Um, we made it so it's going to ignore any amounts less than 10 cents and combine the row with an existing row for the employee amount. Uh, uh, so one show, because what was happening, <clears throat> it was actually adding two lines for the employee and it was showing like an 04 line with like, you know, three cents or whatever. And this was basically because of a, pay, you know, maybe the last pay on an old job, new pay on a new job or whatever. And it was really causing a problem because it would just show like, you know, two cents or whatever. And that was an issue. So uh, manually, the districts pretty much had to update the tape file and take that two cents, add it to the other line that was on there for the employees. So add that two cents earnings on there and remove that 04 entry line in order for the submission files to be corrected. So we fixed that. So anything 10 cents and lower, we fixed it now. So it combines it with that 01 regular amount on the report. <clears throat> we also added, um, hold on here, we're looking. Uh, Oh, here we go. Uh, on the SCRS monthly report, we have the incorrect date range was being used when calculating the fiscal to date member earnings. So we updated that, uh, we updated it, and when we find historical employee pay information to calculate the fiscal to date member earnings, we use July 1st of the current fiscal year because in the past we were not using July 1st, we were using like, <clears throat> maybe a previous date and it was including like, you know, the June, maybe the last June pay of the other, the last fiscal year, that was incorrect. So we updated it. So now it's using July 1st on that SCRS monthly report instead of using the incorrect uh, start date. Um, <clears throat> also on the SCRS monthly report, amounts were sometimes being doubled for the first month after the import due to how the calculations were taking place. So when you imported, amounts were being doubled. And um, we, we corrected this on, from the, on the USPSR 3687 JIRA um, issue. So that should be corrected now. Um, and also on the STRS monthly report, cal calculations were updated um, to be more consistent with how uh, similar calculations were handled in other reports after the import. So that report, there were a lot of issues with it and it wasn't calculated correctly like other reports do. So they made the correction to the SCRS monthly report to make it calculate correctly instead of like doubling and things like that um, <clears throat> to kind of follow the same pattern as other reports do. So when you do an import now, it should be a much better than it used to be. On the STRS new hire report, um, we only include an empl one employee with multiple positions. And again, it's just like we did with SDRS new hire. We had, if an employee had multiple positions, they were showing up for the, the new hire STRS new hire report, you know, with, you know, if they had three positions, they were showing up on there three times. We corrected that to now only show that employee one time. On the SRS per pay report, we improved how the payrolls are selected internally. <clears throat> so we corrected it to pull only data from the payroll that is selected when running the report. So 
if say there's two identical dates, maybe they processed two identical date payrolls and they went in and selected, you know, maybe there's two payrolls from September 3rd and they selected only the one payroll that they wanted from September 3rd before it was including both of the payrolls. And obviously we don't want that. They, they select, selected the one because that's the one they wanted and it wasn't doing that. Well, now they corrected it. So whichever one they select, it's only going to pull that information in. Um, we did an update on the direct deposit and check printing to take the print employer amount flag on the payroll item into consideration. And maybe some of you noticed this, but what happened is on the, <clears throat> excuse me, on the um, payroll item configuration record, let me just pull this up here. Maybe. Okay, let me just pull up an annuity. No, better yet, let's do Medicare. Oh, where are you? Here. <clears throat> if this box, oops, if this box is print employer amount, was, if it, even if it was checked, when we made this fix, when they processed the direct deposits, the employer amount was not appearing on the direct deposits. So now, as long as this box is checked, it should the, the employer amount should actually show on the direct deposit pay stub. Before, um, we weren't real uh, consistent with this and we kind of corrected it. So now if this is checked, it should show. If it's not checked, it's not gonna show. And the thing about it is, um, we, I, I know we had districts that said, hey, you know, the employer amount always used to, it used to show, well, now it's not. The reason it didn't is because we really weren't looking at this. So what we found was maybe they had some things that were marked uh, print employer amount on the configuration record. Those, those still appeared on the check sub, but when you look at the configuration record, there were some that didn't have it marked. And that's the reason that they didn't show. So now if they want it to show, they got to make sure that that box is marked. We didn't make that update and that correction. So like I said, now, if districts have it marked, it should be showing on the, on the direct deposit records. Uh, we had an improvement on that for our 647 release. We improved the filtering on the lead balance report to compare uh, positions with pay groups. Uh, that were selected with running a report before, like if, they, if a pay group was selected, like it sometimes was including um, more than what the, the district was wanting. So we corrected that. And then only the positions with pay groups that were selected should be uh, included on that, uh, on that report now when they, when they process it. We also added a C the CSV and uh, XLS output option to the payroll item detail report. So if a district is processing their payroll, they can now go in and I think actually I can pull this up even on an old payroll. Go back in here and look. You can see now that when you process the payroll item detail report, you have the option of CSV or XLS option to process that in. I'm pretty sure this will work even on prior payrolls that were out there. Let me look. Yeah. So you now have those two options, those formatting options as well. Um, some new features that we added. Uh, we updated a favorite icon to the new uh, SFD, to, to the new SFDT logo. So um, I can go in here and you can see right up here, this is the SSDT logo, logo, and you can, this is my test account that I'm in. We added that. So actually now that's out there, just, just in case you wanted to know that. Um, we added the new SARS monthly report. So I can go out to SARS reporting and you can see now that we have the SARS monthly report out there. 
We had several requests for that. I think actually the auditors wanted that. We actually added that now, so that's out there as well. Uh, we added a new configuration option to allow direct deposits to send to all emails or primary only. So if a district has multiple email addresses on the employee record and they want the direct deposits to go to all of them, if they want that, they would go to the configuration option and go to the email direct deposit notice configuration. And you'll see on there now, we have a checkbox, send notifications to all addresses. So like I said, if they have multiple email addresses and they want to send those notices to all of those email addresses, they have to make sure this box is checked in order to do that. Um, let's see what else. Oh, we added the ability to use the classic pay amount, pay types in the direct deposit notific notifications. So when printing checks or direct deposit notices, the pay stub, the pay stub DESC is now available. Before it was not. Um, now we added that so you can actually use that. So in the XML output, a new pay type code is available to show the abbreviations. So like your REG, REG, the ACC, the MIS, the DFR, other pay type options. On the PDF version, it's based on the XDOC and the build is uh, in the build in default, which is an XDOC, was not changed. So we did not make any changes to that, but the pay type code is now available for the district to use if they want to add that to their custom form files. They can actually add that information there and it will actually show on the direct deposits now. Um, we added a, a new payroll item summary report in the payroll view. So after the payroll is initialized, there's a report called pay item summary report. And that is, is kind of a replacement for the dead tote report from Classic. Uh, so the report is going to be available for an initialized pay as well as a posted payroll. So if I go into pro payroll processing, <clears throat> and let's just say I initialize a payroll. I should have initialized it before. Didn't do that, should have. What is going on? Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, you're coming through okay. Okay, I just got a thing that said it. it the host is asking you to unmute and it looked like I was muted. Okay, I just wanna make sure you guys have been hearing me. <laughs> okay, so oh, now I hope, you- I hope I didn't click on you. Okay, now, so I initialized the payroll and you can see now we have this pay amount summary report on here, which in the past we did not have that something new that we added. So if I go in and process that report, um, I'll just generate it. You can actually see the information on that report now and it is very nice. Um, one thing about this report, <clears throat> you can process it in PDF, CSV, Excel format, doesn't matter, whatever format you wanna process it in. Uh, but for now, it doesn't look like that report is uh, stored in the archives. It can be regenerated off of history at any time. So like, let's just say that we ran through the payroll process, you know, and, and three payrolls later, you want to look at that report, you can actually run it again, just like you can like the pay report. Uh, I'll go ahead and pull this up. If it, my, my internet must be kind of slow here. There we go. Okay, so here's your your pay amount payroll item summary report. <clears throat> Hold on, that's not it. That's the pay summary. Oh dear. Hold on. Let me go back. 
that's the pay amount. We want the payroll item. So I clicked the wrong one. Hold on here. What is going on? <clears throat> right here is your payroll item summary report. Sorry. Let's try this one more time. It would help if I click on the correct report. All right, let's pull this up. Here we go. And again, this is just like your bed tote report from Classic. And that's what districts were asking for. So we actually include that now. That looks better. Okay, a um, couple more things that we have here. Um, another new feature that we added was the accumulations were added to the dashboard. So if I go in and find an employee, I go to the employee dashboard and I go to the leaves. I can now go in, we have an accumulations tab and you'll actually be able to see that employee's accumulations. Okay, there we go. So here's all of the employees accumulations. So we added that to the dashboard as well. One, one other thing I forgot to show you, you probably saw this, but um, on the payroll processing, you'll notice that we kind of made a little bit of an update here. Um, we, we changed the look of the payroll processing screen. So now like all the payrolls are in order. So like I have this one in, you know, in progress, but everything from previous, you know, is, is listed separately underneath. And then if I pull up the detail of that payroll, again, you could see we have multiple reports sitting out there when we added that payroll item summary report. It kind of moved everything around a little bit. So your district will, I'm sure they'll see it and they'll be aware of it, but just wanted to let you know that just in case. Um, does anybody have any questions? Like I said, things got moved around here a little bit. But all the reports, everything's still there. It's just that they're kind of moved around in a different, different style. So does anybody have any questions regarding what we just went over? If not, we'll go ahead and have Pat go ahead and start the USAS portion. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Have a great weekend. And Pat, take it away. Okay, so I'll go through the releases 8.24 through 8.28.1, which was a hot fix. And again, it's July through August. And we're going to start with the first release of the fiscal year, which included the AR billings um, release 8.24. One of these changes included being able to customize a form. And I have put like the logo and SSDT invoice and thank you, have a nice day on the template. You can find the template under the AR billings at the bottom. Just open that up and if you need help, there's uh, more information here. This is all in the wiki. But I already have that template uploaded, but when you, when you do go to upload your, your template, You'll um, create a form and this will pop up. You can name it or put a description. The entity type would be billing. You select your form and I selected the one that we just looked at and then saved. So then when you go to your billings, I'll show you what it looks like as a print. When you choose, PDF, you now have that option. And now my bill will look like this in a moment. So the logo, thank you, have a nice day. So you can put whatever you want for the district. Um, 
let's see. Also, you have the ability to email the billings, but before you uh, send your first email, you should print it out because if it prints okay, it will email okay. So that's just a tip. Also on that release. Sorry, I, can we choose the form on the email or is it still just the standard? Um, it is under configuration and I will show you that in just a moment. Okay. Well, they, actually, they, that's, that's actually up next. Um, oh. Under configuration, this is where you can set up your default form and your custom email message and your form, whether it's the default form or your customer or your my new form. So here under the accounts receivable billing email setup, you'll have your from email and your carbon copy if you choose and you see the hovering tips. And then you can customize your message. And like I said, you can pick your form. Are there plans to make it so you can choose the form on the when you do the email? Because we have districts that you know have different forms for different groups. And so it wouldn't be smart to make one the default for the email. I see what you mean. You're right. Um, I'm not sure if there's a feedback out there. I can check or you can put in a ticket and then that'll remind me to check too. I don't remember that as a feedback, but that, that would be a good feedback. Um, so once you have that set up, when you go back to your billing, and I know Radio Shack billing prints okay, Um, my setup from the email from Mickey Mouse came up as well as the message. And when I'm sending one, I can customize the email and send it. Actually, let me send one. Well, I'm not going to send it. The email will say what you set up. The other thing is if you pick more than one and you go to email, you see that you don't have any options to change. And that's because under these customers, um, in order to email, you must have an email set up. So when you're emailing multiple, it's going to multiple places. So you really can't customize where unless you send just one. Um, When you do email it, you have your information box of how many sent or how many failed. And I guess that's it on the accounts receivable. Are there any other questions on the billing, the customizing? So since we started with the first release over here, I'm just gonna go right to left with the menu options. And the next item I have is account filters. On the August 27th release, 8.28, we made the account filters um, have the ability to inactivate it by just unchecking it. However, um, once an account filter has been marked inactive, and it's assigned to another user account, that user will not have access to any accounts. So to double check that, um, I would go to the user's grid under system, add the filter's name to your grid. And then if I wanted to um, make the custodial filter inactive for a particular user of Joyce, I'm going to also inactivate these two people if I inactivate the filter. So that's one way to double check before you make the account filter inactive. When account filters are inactive and it's used in a report or is part of a, part of a report contained in a bundle, the report will generate but it'll be blank. Um, and that is why um, 
I don't know where my thought was going on that one, sorry. Um, and we also have the ability to clone the count filter. So you edit or view, hit clone, and then you can proceed from there. So that makes it nice. And I believe in the upcoming releases, you can insert a line as well as move in the, like if you have three lines in your account filter, you'll be able to um, position, position it by dragging it. That's coming up. On the 8.25 release, we had a couple changes to the account change. Um, the account change process was processing um, the month end and year end report bundles as it reopened and reclosed the posting periods. So now with that change, it, the report bundles will not run with that. And there was a bug that um, that was created or that was fixed to eliminate like duplicate count changes. So in reality, you might have several down here. And if you accidentally pick a duplicate one to try to save it, it's going to now give you that error message that it already exists. Um, on, I think it was 8.23.1, the whole process of account change was improved by 94.5%. Rules, there are a few rules um, that prevented an, an inactive account from being used, whether it was marked inactive or with stop dates. And there were existing rules for um, like purchase orders, but I'll show you the rules that were. So prior there was the disbursement purchase order and requisition with these rules, but now there's distribution interfund cash transactions as well as invoice. These come in as non-mandatory, but you can change that status if you want to enable that rule and then activate the rule. That was on the 8.25 release. We had several re uh, report updates, including these canned reports. One of them being the audit report, which is available from the report menu. And it's improved in so many ways. One of them is speed with the dates entered. These are required fields. And there will be some future updates to the speed. But for now, it's advised to kind of limit these, the date range to, you know, avoid long running reports. But I'll show you. And you have the ability to uh, sort. I'll show you how fast that is. And, oops, there are um, much more information like the PO, the PO number, um, your before and after values, it's, it's a much more useful report. And all you would do is if you wanted your uh, objects, you would just click and drag or by user. Another report that was updated is actually a template report. And that was <clears throat> the summary of expenditure funds. By fund. Um, before the report it was based in, um, it on the fund and the fund's remaining balance included both the revenues and the expenditures, but it's a summary of expenditures report. So in the classic report did not include revenues. So now this report will 
only show you expenditure information. So, and it makes more sense because the expendable minus the expended minus the encumbered is giving you the remaining balance. And that's how it sh how class F worked and how it now works. Um, on the 8.26 release, there was an outstanding PO detail template report that now excludes the system adjustments from the PO charges posted by the system that was um, posted as a result of his account change process. So those will not show any longer. As well as in the report bundles, um, the outstanding reports included in the monthly report bundles now have the start dates removed. So in my July report, I'm in August, I pull that report up. You can see there's just an end date. So it's going to give me all my outstanding purchase orders from day one to July 31st. And you can see in this database, there are some old POs. But what is nice is, close your eyes, I'm going to scroll to the bottom. It's 2,27,39. 2, and if I run my cash summary, it's going to match. Close your eyes, I'm scrolling. So it makes more sense. Everything matches and those start the dates for those outstanding reports, like the outstanding purchase order report was updated. The outstanding disbursement summary report was updated. And so those are implemented as, as of August 13th. Another canned report is, was the account status report. This report will show um, both the budget and the revenue activity on one single report. But now the PO charges are included on this report. Um, and I didn't write down the release number or date, but this was updated. And I will run one for fund 06. Oh, and one of the changes too was on this report was the ability to use the filter, which I didn't choose, but it's been added to this menu. And I'll show you in a minute more about that after this report finishes. So you can see you have the PO information, your invoice information, all the way to your receipt encumbered and expended. So it's a much more complete report now. Regarding this account filter though, I'm in like the administrator view and I'll show you in a minute under like a uh, user view. But the drop down on the account filter is, will display the filter that's pre-selected on the user. So let me, log in as, as Joyce, as my test user. She has a filter on her self. So when she goes to run the account status report, you can see how that's grayed out and unchangeable. Um, this this behavior is going to be improved in future releases, but it was put in place temporarily to enforce the count filters. Um, but the, with the future update, it'll be more useful because, say, Joyce has um, custodial and transportation filters, and I can't even choose which one to run here. So in the future, that'll be updated. So when a user has two, you can choose between the two. 
Um, a requisition update was done in August 13th to correct a problem that just prevented users from entering a delivery address when processing requisitions. And then on July 30th, the ability to modify and delete refunds without checks have been implemented. And I know that's been asked a lot. So let me show you in a moment when this catches up with me. Um, so the delete button is now available. I think I'm still processing, but give me a moment. There we go. So I, this, you can see that this refund doesn't have a check. So the icon is available to delete that asks if you want to. It's just the internet for today. So let me check. Well, that's processing the deletion, it will delete. Um, also on 8.13, which was the release 8.27, we corrected a problem that prevented the printing of a PDF of a receipt that had an item of zero. So if I look at this, actually, if I go to print this, You can see now it, it does print the PDF with that zero amount for whatever reason that is zero. It will now print. And advances. The repay advance option to allow users the ability to select account has been implemented on the 8.25 release but only those accounts that are eligible to be used to repay the original advance will appear in the dropdown. So, oops. So in these dropdowns, that wasn't a good example, was it? Anyway, that drop down is what I was referring to. If you have multi, there we go. I don't know why that didn't work the first time. <laughs> so, whatever accounts eligible will show in the drop down. And the order of those accounts have been updated to be in like proper order on the 8.26 release as well. And then the fund of eight or 584 has been updated per the auditor of state that was on the release 8.26. So it used to be called a drug-free school grant fund. And you can see that it still it still does, but if I was to create one. Um, it would now populate with the title for part A, student support and academic enrichment. If you had that set up before, you could go into the fund, edit it, blank it out and, you know, refresh it so that it, it reflects the new name. So we've made it through the menus. Some of the performance updates included those canned reports like the purchase order report. This was improved by 95%. Um, I'll just click it and show you how fast that is. Hopefully, yeah, let's say that's improved. Another one was the budget summary canned report. And again, you have all these options to choose and select. 
but the speed has been improved by 68% on a release in July. And the disbursement detail report was also um, improved. And that was actually improved 91% on a hot fix 8.25.2. And then another one was the appropriation, oops, amounts by the cash account. That was improved by 99.57%. And as well as right before like July, like the financial detail was improved and the loading of the template report definitions were improved. So we're making improvements. However, there's still always bug fixes. And we had several patches for individual districts for various reasons. In August 13th on 8.27 release, um, we corrected an error message when adding a cash account with an invalid special cost center. And I believe we just saw that when I added that. Um, there was an appropriate error describing the invalid special cost center, but there was also an exception thrown that has been corrected. And I apologize, I might mute myself in a moment. My, the UPS man is here and the dog might bark. So hopefully not. Um, on July 30th, on the 8.26 release, a patch was, correct, was implemented to correct the archived carryover amounts, previously showing as zero. Now the PO refresh is no longer needed in those situations. That was July 30th. On August 4th, we, we corrected a problem that prevented the report bundles from generating. And August 27th on the 8.28, there was a bug that resulted in a 404 error when a user would log in with the correct credentials, but after a failed login attempt. So that's been corrected too. So enough of those bug fixes. And time for some exciting updates. We've had the inventory program implemented. It's a work in progress, but a handful of districts went through the beta or the testing phase. And those districts are now live as of August, still balancing and testing, I guess. But um, inventory is not a standalone program but it's used with you, SASR, being installed first. Um, so like the AR module, there are some balancing and steps to follow. Um, we will have a session at the OEDSA conference next week, if you are going, and it'll be a demonstration of the inventory, as well as there was a demo link in the last newsletter that you could watch. Another, New feature was is the workflow um, module. This will be another topic at the OEDSA conference that will include a, like a demo of the requisition approval workflow process, as well as uh, touch and base on the employee onboarding workflow process in the USPS side. So, the requisition approval workflows, as well as the employee onboarding, is still in the testing beta stage. There are about four districts um, that are um, testing, working with it, improving it along the way. And you probably have seen updates since July regarding these things. The plan is to release it to go live September 22nd. And some of those release notes that you may have seen included um, a correction where the requisition charges were being inflated as it was being approved. That's been corrected in August 12th. And then August 27th, there was um, the creation of an admin view that's now available so that, and as well as a bypass user. So 
you could have like a bypass user to recall requisitions that are like in the process, but you have to bypass it to speed it up. That's now available. And then with the help of the prioritization committee, they came up with a like three rejection typical answers that are now in the software as buttons. So if you're going to reject a requisition, you can choose, you have the ability to write the reason and you can choose the button that says wrong account code. You can choose the button that says, please submit a July 1st PO or please add a vendor. And again, you have the ability to write some text as well, like submit your purpose and budget statement of something like that. And then on an upcoming release, the cash account, I believe this is on the next release, but the cash account for the 200 student managed account, uh, student managed activity account will now change from the custodial fund type. I'm sorry, I should have went in the It'll change from the custodial type to the special revenue. And if you recall, um, this was planned to be implemented after period H was submitted, which was at the end of August. So that'll be the, on the first release in September. That is all I have. Are there any questions? I have a question from earlier, you said something about a user having multiple filters. And I didn't think that uh, you could set more than one filter for an, uh, an account or, you know, a person. Is that, am I wrong? No, I might be wrong. Um, I should have probably waited for that release. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Let me see what I have in my notes. Because I swear I read that. Um, we'll just say there's something about that filter that's going to be changed. That's probably not a good filter. Because it's a, a anonymous data. Yeah, you're right. So disregard that. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have presented or mentioned what was coming up. I am looking. Where I said that. I don't know, but I think it must have been, I don't know, but right now you're right. It's only one filter. Okay. So this Dave Shepard is only limited to that under like the account status report. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, what we do have coming up though, oops, next week is though as a conference, you wouldn't sign up here, but, um, you could go to the OEDSA website if you wanted to register. So the SSD team will be down there presenting several sessions, updates, workflow demo, inventory demo. Um, and then we do have the dates for the intermediate topics. We were just in the planning stage, so we'll definitely get these clickable links to register updated soon. But the dates are out here for the calendar year and checklist so that um, you can plan your year end training as well. So we'll have those links updated as well, too. Are there any questions? If not, I guess I'll let you go. Have a great weekend, and I hope to see some of you guys next week. Thanks, everybody.